Hey, welcome back to the Dusty Wheel. I'm your host, The Innkeeper, and this is our live call and talk show all about the Wheel of Time. Now, before we get into our live adaptation with our guests and everything, I want to remind you that this upcoming Watt Wednesday, we're talking about the Yael and if they have a future in the Fourth Age, and if so, why. <laughs> we're going to be discussing Terangrail, we're discussing just all the visions and things related to this with my guest Colin from Randland TV podcast and Seth from Watt Spoilers. I can't wait to do our first deep dive. I feel like it's been months now. So that one's going to be great. And then don't miss this next Sunday. Yes, this is going to be the definitive Wheel of Time fan guide for season one episodes. All the news, leaks, speculation. We're going to put it all together. I have a huge list of guests for this one beginning with Adam Whitehead from Wirt Zone and Dragon Mount. We're also going to have John from What Up, and we're going to have Jen from Talk Around Riyadh. And then for the first time ever here on the Dusty Wheel, uh, we're getting really geeky because we're going to have Geeky Airy as our fourth guest for that Sunday. I can't wait to do that one. This is going to be amazing. We're going to touch on everything. So yeah, don't miss these next two. I want to say they're both deep dives, <laughs> deep dive episodes. In fact, I think all the rest of our episodes for this month are that kind. So don't miss Watt Wednesday or I guess Watt Sunday these days is how we're calling it. So that being said, without further ado, let me bring all my guests into the show. Welcome everyone to the Dusty Wheel. How are we doing? Hey. <laughs> hey. I look like Mary. All about the books. All yeah, about the books. All about the book. All right, right. Uh, Natalia cannot be with us tonight. Uh, she had to uh, take care of some family stuff. So... We miss her, but welcome Steve Coffin. <laughs> or Steve. Adam. How are you doing? Steve. Steve. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Hello and good evening from the UK. How are you all doing? Fantastic. So for those of you that don't know, Steve Coffin, or Adam here, actually was the creator of the hashtag Twitter of Time. When exactly did you become a fan of the Wheel of Time? Like give us like a quick summary of, you know, how Adam came to be the creator of the hashtag Twitter of Time. So I picked up part one and two of The Eye of the World about 12, 13 years ago now, I think, uh, in an airport bookstore. Fell in love with it, fell in love with the characters, and I was really excited at this whole typical fantasy of people being taken away from a village by some sort of mystic with her warrior. And then I read through books two to nine in about two months, Nice. And then <laughs> I had to then deal with the joy of waiting for each book as it came out. And I remember the excitement of having to wait for Crossroads of Twilight. But in between then, sorry to say, Matt, I was a devout fan of Theoryland. So nice. dating you <laughs> a little place. bit there. I apologize. <laughs> um, Twitter of Time came about because when I originally created Thailand's toy, it was meant to be, or the plan was that I was going to retweet the wheel of time, but have it as Matt as kind of like the main reason behind everything. And yeah. then it kind of devolved. Then I kind of didn't do anything with it for a number of years while I was at university. And then I picked it all up. And then I started posting the what now comics which are sadly no longer produced but were fantastic and still are and then from that a small group of wheel of time fans kind of found each other we wanted to find a way to identify ourselves wheel of twitter had already been taken so twitter <laughs> of time was formed awesome yeah twitter time I mean, for those of you that are not on twitter it is a it's a fun diverse community of fans you know, from old to new, there's even some hashtags like first watt timer is a new one out there, which I think is great. There's a whole community around reading Wheel of Time for the first time because Twitter of Time is not a spoiler free community. That's for sure. Uh, if you go look up the hashtag Twitter of Time, you will see everything from the beginning to the end. Uh, you might not know if you should believe it because there's a lot of speculation there, too. But Twitter time is a lot of fun. I recommend if you're not there join in uh, whether or not it's your from your personal account or you want to create a character account which there i see some of those people here in chat with us it's it's just it's one of the thriving wheel of time communities out there and uh yeah so we appreciate having you here with us and with that being said mary todd awesome to see you let's jump into this you mary you were not with us this um 
you were not with us this last uh, one that we did. Live Vitation, right? The last Live Vitation. So Swana Sadai of the Weaves of the Wheel community and Todd and I, we kind of made it through the first, I want to say six chapters. So for those of you that are watching, we're going to jump into chapter seven of The Dragon Reborn. This is part two of our live adaptation if you've never done this with us before. Uh, and Taylor, you can throw up a spoiler warning if you'd like. Uh, the This is a relatively spoiler free in the sense that we're discussing the Dragon Reborn, but we talk about larger themes about why we want to keep some of these plots, why we want to cut them, why we want to maybe modify them. So we do dig into things that happen later on in the books. So if you don't want any spoilers from later on in the, in the books, then don't continue watching or listening to us, but we will try our best to not just go about ruining things for people here that may have read, you know, ahead of this, but not all the way. So that's our that's our uh, warning to you. Let's get started in chapter seven, um, and I and I'm going to make a case that chapter seven is kind of boring, and it's really just the way to get to chapter eight. <laughs> is there anything that any of my panelists here in chapter seven of the Dragon Reborn think we need to redeem, and we need to make sure from a characterization standpoint or plot standpoint we get, or can we just say they're traveling and we get to Jara? Well, uh, yeah. chapter seven is only six pages long. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, I see you all kind of shaking your heads. Are you uh, on board with this, Adam? Did you see anything in there that needs to be called out from like in the TV sh series itself? The only important thing I think is Lan's conversation or Lorne's conversation with Moraine about Morel. I think that is the only important thing as a setup, which I think needs to be included. But whether or not that is here now, elsewhere, yeah. I can cut from this point in time, but I feel that that is an important point because it shows that growing tension between the two characters, particularly with Nynaeve now thrown into the mix as well. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And, and that's one of those things we can absolutely pull into other, you know, other events, right? We don't need to have this traveling moment where they have this discussion. We don't need this exposition right here. So yeah, I think we're good. I think we can just jump in technically well, to chapter. Oh, go ahead, Mary. I, I would make the, the point that this would be, you know, you could, if we needed have a traveling montage here, you know, everybody has to get sure. up and start chasing Rand. And, you know, we've got the great scene with Moraine fishing and being able to just grab the fish basically right out of the, right out of the lake that's, or out of the river. That's a um, little bit of, you know, breadth but not depth of story type of thing but I, I i could see it being really funny and taking like a minute at most of just music and they're traveling and you know little vignette scenes and it's something weird happening and then somebody telling parent well she's i said i you know so you know yeah, yeah. that was kind of the theme of this this chapter is you know she got away with everything because she's i said i and everyone's like oh she's i said i she's i said i and uh you know, you could use, you know, 30 seconds tops of them traveling uh, to get to Jara, the next chapter. And uh, it, it could be amusing. Yeah. Yeah. I like I like this idea. You know, I, I still think the mirror, the discussion necessarily that Adam, you brought up, I think that could happen later. But I I do. I, I'm a, I'm a, I take on a, a montage here would be fun and having more mm -hmm. rain kind of maybe step back from the maybe the the tense anxious nature of maybe the first drive both to the eye of the world and then to Toman head and uh, maybe something kind of fun here would be good yeah I, I like it do you think she cheated i think she cheated yeah that's a good that's a good question okay did yeah i want to ask this is my first this is my first question for those of you who are watching on twitter and facebook we won't see your answers here but do you think maureen cheated in, in <laughs> when it came to this fishing, fishing moment uh, thumbs up in chat here on in YouTube if you think she cheated. Thumbs down if you think it was just pure skill. What do we think, Adam? Are you a are you a cheated or a pure just just skill? Oh, she cheated. <laughs> come on, come on. It, you don't think this is just pure skill? <laughs> well, without going completely non suitable, it all depends on what Suwon taught her when they were in the tower. We know that she's a terror fish again. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I like it. Uh, Mary, are you, uh, she cheated? No, gonna... that was skill. Skill is skill. She's been, she's been living in the, on the, in the rough for 20 years, looking for the Dragon Reborn, a little less than 20 years. She needs some skills. <laughs> I am seeing, uh, you know, it seems like a mixed bag here in chat. You know, I like Carolina said, uh, <laughs> what about cheated with pure skill? That's right. <laughs> or uh, Miss Sarah James, a fish tickling Tarang rail. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes. 
I, I love the uh, I love the ideas in chat. It's great. Uh, no, th- this was a good this was a good call out. Thanks, Mary, for bringing that up and Adam. But I think this can be done really quickly, uh, especially that piece. You know, just the montage, and we can jump into what is probably the most significant chapter. You know, in this traveling section that we're going to be talking about, uh, or one of the most significant that deals with at least the boys, uh, Jara. And so I want to take a broad look at this first. Um, when it comes to this experience that they have, um, Perrin, Moraine, and obviously Gnome, and what happens here in Jara, Todd, what, what do you think for the Wheel of Time on Amazon Prime, the TV series, Rafe and his team have to get right? What has to be extracted from here, whether or not we keep it right here? But what has to come out of this chapter that stays in the TV series? What are the broad themes for you? That Gnome is full wolf and that Perrin is headed that direction. They have to, they have to show, you know, Perrin has to see that it, this is where he could end up, end up. And, you know, but they, I think they ha- really have to show that Gnome is full on wolf. There's no human left to him at all. Yeah, I like, uh, that is, I think, I agree that we do, you know, <laughs> We know there's going to be wolves. We know that uh, Perrin, this this idea has not been taken out of the show, at least for now, right? We, we've seen wolves show right. up in leaked photos and such. So we're assuming that that means that Perrin still has this ability. And, uh, and so I think you're right. Whether or not it has to happen right in this moment, that's less important to me. And But this has to happen. And I think this is a great time for it to happen for sure adam is there something else that you would say before we dig into the what needs to come out of those pieces is there any like broad idea here that needs to come out whether or not it's about the world or about individuals in this section about jara i think master harrod the innkeeper is just a person needs to be cut um and you just have mother room as the wisdom combining the two um in terms of when it goes in the show i would probably have music which we have for eyeless kind of like what daniel was talking about last week with rand and Logain, and almost have callbacks to that because we've seen eyeless as a wolf brother that is still in possession of his humanity while mm. with gnome this is someone who as todd said is now more wolf than man and we need to always have that balance and show Heron that he's got one of two paths that he can go down. It's either becoming Eyeless who separates himself from humanity and spends more time with the wolves or he becomes like Gnome and becomes a creature possessed and locked in a cage. I like this idea that you're bringing up, which is that they could make a callback um, and have Perrin really be considering both of these uh, experiences that he's had. Uh, you know, I hadn't thought about actually pulling that in, but they can very much from a visual standpoint, you know, show us uh, those two, the, the two opposite paths, the, the, two, the two paths that parent can gets to choose from. I do like what Todd said, which is, you know, uh, pushing on people, making them feel like this is the pathway parents headed towards more. So I, I think there's like more danger in that one. It could be interesting for them to really embed in parent being more wolf, especially with what happened prior to this right when the bat when the trollocs come in perrin does kind of go almost full wolf right uh and he loses it and i think you know leaning that direction is really good so um and that's i think that to me that is uh you know an important piece mary outside of the wolves uh themselves is there anything from this chapter you think is key for them to keep or that you would recommend cutting um this chapter has one of my favorite uh small time characters uh he only shows up i think in this chapter and that's simeon the uh, the stable hand as you know somebody who uh he was just kind of fun he was he was just an honest genuine person that you know here they are they're scared they're tri- chasing rand they're you know dark friends all around they've just dealt with all these huge things and here's just this normal guy who's a, a normal stand-up working guy um who asks for help for his brother um, and even when he can't, he doesn't get what he wants. He doesn't get his brother back. He's still a good person. And he's still, you know, intuitive and figures things out. And um, I, he's just a fun, uh, fun is not the right word. He's just, a, you know, he, he gets to you. He makes you feel. Uh, he helps Perrin realize, you know, that there is this 
path he may take. Um, and he has to, and, and I like what Maureen says in the next chapter. She says, you think you have a choice in all this. And I think the, the act of choosing is one of the big themes in the Wheel of Time, even though it's a predestination, predestiny world, there is still a choice. Even though Parent has two paths in front of him, he doesn't have to take either. And not to be spoilerific about it, he doesn't take either. He finds his own. Yeah, you're bringing up some interesting thing here, which is that rub of what the story is about, right? It's how much control does the pattern have over your life and how much control do you have over it? And I like that Moiraine almost pushes both of these ideas to all of the all of the Taviran, yeah. which is like, you have a choice, but you don't have a choice. You have a choice, but you don't have a choice. And she kind of retain, re, kind of comes back to this all the time. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I like calling out the choice aspect, but then also the fact that he's Taviran and, you know, the pattern's pushing him a certain way. And I'm sure that that aspect, I want to I see that get to Perrin. I want Perrin to kind of be like, maybe I don't. And maybe the way the pattern's pulling me, maybe I'm going to be Gnome. You know, maybe that is my future and, and having that conflict be present in his mind or show up visually, you know. And I think this is a very visceral, to me, this is one of the more visceral chapters of just what's going on, right? Seeing Gnome is going to be really important. But I want to call out something that I think is really, that I want them to do. This idea that there have been weddings, basically that everyone's gotten married that can get married, <laughs> at this point and you know and and they they're like having some this really young woman get married to this older gentleman that you know and it's just like these co connections and groupings of people that maybe no one had thought were going to I, I think they can have a lot of fun with this right i i think that they can show us you know uh, you know maybe montage weddings you know and have rand <laughs> show rand playing music at these weddings and and uh when when simeon i think it's simeon is talking about it or uh you know, I, I, this aspect of Rand's effect and when Moiraine calls us out of like, he's the strongest of Viren, basically, she thinks, and since the age of legends. So showing his effect on, you know, the populace and how they're basically going to be able to follow Rand is following the, the effects of his Taviran nature is, I think, something I would like to see them. And like I said, they can have so much fun with this. Um, whether or not from terrible things that happen or good things, they can, the, the randomness of what happens, uh, I think is something that they definitely need to include. You, you must know that Rand's Tavirin. Now, I think that. Now, I want to pose this to everyone <laughs> that was watching in chat. And if you're here for the first time, hopefully you'll give us a like in this video. You'll let, you know, other fans out there know and come join us here live. So please like, and if this is the first time you've never followed us before and you enjoy weekly live Wheel of Time content, please subscribe to the channel. It really kind of helps drive us to keep bringing this every week. So we really appreciate everyone that's here. And if you're over on Twitter and Facebook here shortly in about uh, you know a couple minutes, your sneak peek into our episode will end, but just come over to Facebook, I mean, sorry, to YouTube, find us at the Dusty Wheel and come join us in chat. Now, that being said, I want to ask this to everyone in chat and to you three and Adam, I'll give you the first shot. How much does Rafe and his team, how much do they have to embed in the concept of Taviran? Do we need Taviran? Do we need, does the audience need to understand Taviran? Like, is that so key to this TV series that they have to understand this concept and it has to be part of the show and we have to embed in the exposition of it we need to understand it? Do you think Taviran is that key especially this early maybe in the show we need a level of understanding absolutely because Taverna is so kind of it is the reason why they are where they are and why everything happens i would probably play on it more and almost have Taverna like aspects so both the good and the bad kind of portray in the show more often almost like a string of unfortunate events or likewise just a string of good luck things happen and you can blame it on Taviran. but i see there is a lot of explanation and exposition which could probably be thrown in earlier or later uh, particularly in chapter nine when she is talking about um him being the strongest Taviran since the age of legends and then talk land talking about hawkwing so I think it's important, but not necessarily completely essential or possibly showed a different way. 
Okay. Uh, and do you guys differ? I, I see most chats saying we have to have, we have to have. And I agree, this, it does set apart the Wheel of Time, right? It, it is a mechanism of the wheel. I mean, it's the Wheel of Time after all. It is, uh, Taviran is part of that wheel. And so not having it would be strange <laughs> somewhat, right. uh, especially because these kind of things that happen, the random occurrences would be less clear as to why they were happening. And you would always be up there like, oh, they're just lucky. You know, maybe everything ends up being a, uh, a deus ex machina, right? It's like, oh, sure, that happened, you know. Um, and if you explain it up front, people start to understand it. So, um, And if you have these, ran these random happenstances that, uh, it, in theory, it could happen, but having, having that tavern there uh, made it more likely to happen. That gives you the, the mechanism that you need to explain other parts of the plot. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to see how important you kind of uh, was the, was the thought here, and I, and I agree. And we don't have to kind of embed on this question very off uh, very long, but I I wanted to bring that up. Is there anything else here, Todd, that you think you know the Taviran nature of the wheel and how it deals with Rand? Uh, Perrin's call out here as far as gnome and the wolves. Is there anything else that you think we need to get out of this chapter from that's important to the TV series that either drives plots or from a characterization standpoint? I, I mean, when a guy with an accent tells you something's got to be a certain way, you go with it, right? Isn't that how we? <laughs> is yeah. that is that is that the answer? Now, yeah. uh, so, so one thing I no, I, I agree with what he said, and and I mean that we can have loyal just explain it a lot deeper than he does. I mean, he already explained it, but it, I think the biggest thing people need to know is that Taverinus kind of goes both ways. It can work for you, and sometimes it works against you. Um, and I think as long as they got that, then then uh, they got a pretty good understanding of what it is. So uh, I do want to bring up one piece here, and I want to hear what you have to say about it, Mary. White cloaks. We do know that the white cloaks are involved in this chapter. Uh, yes. Do do we need to see them here along this journey? Do you find that their search for Perrin Ibarra is an important linchpin to future things that the TV show might do? Or do you feel like there's been enough interaction with the White Cloaks at this point, we don't need to have them always kind of on the trail of Perrin everywhere? When, you know, is, is, that, is that a key piece to this? Well, the White Cloaks were in exposition here. We didn't actually see him. It was just right. talked about. So you know, mentioning it is, no, that, is not that big a deal. Okay. And so you think that we, we can, need... we can leave it there and, you know, and see what happens uh, from there? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm in favor of that. Like, there's no real great reason to not potentially include them here. So um, I like the idea of, uh, <laughs> like, Art Anastasia said, white cloaks could marry each other in chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can, have, you can have fun with the white cloaks. It, right, some crazy stuff does happen with the white cloaks. You know, they try to burn down the town. They do, they, the, some just quit, you know. And so that does give, you know, a, a chance for there to be kind of some nature of understanding the white cloak the white cloaks from what they do and how the public reacts to them. So uh, I, I like that. Uh, the, I like that aspect of leaving them in <laughs> I like hashtag white cloak wedding. <laughs> That's a good one. I, I think that one should endure from the show. I, you know, uh, we need, we need the white cloak wedding to show up in, in the wheel of time TV series. Let's, I, I want to see, I kind of, kind of, now I'm really curious. So for those of you that are watching in chat, thumbs up. If you think Jara um needs a white cloak wedding thumbs down if you're like no that's too much <laughs> i like this i like that hashtag coming out of this one i want to bring up before we move on there is some there are some interesting comments moraine actually includes here and i think they're important to call out she talks about gnome and she says he will not die by my actions but i cannot and will not promise that it will always be so we must find rand and i will not fail in that is that spoken plain enough for you I feel like that, that just, you know, whatever, those, those, that, those two sentences, that needs to be in the show. Like, uh, we need to be re this reinforced that Moraine believes that this is so important that she is willing to kind of, you know, um, cross some lines, if you will, that others are not, um, or at least make people believe that she is willing to cross those lines. So, uh, but I like that she said, I will not promise that it will always be so to Perrin. Like that's a, to me that, that comes across uh, really important, I think. So, uh, and that's what I do want to see. Now we jump into chapter nine, unless there's anything else anyone wants to bring up from chapter eight. 
Okay, so let's jump in chapter nine because there's the piece here that uh, focuses on uh, wolf dreams. And Perrin's pretty upset by what he's experienced. And at this point, he, you know, he goes back, he's kind of thinking about it. He goes to Moiraine and they talk about this aspect. Uh, just this in particular, Adam, do we, do we need this exposition moment of relationship between Moraine and Perrin to build that connection? You know, it could just be looked at as exposition, but there could be some characterization here that's interesting. Do you like leaving this um, interaction between Moraine kind of telling Perrin something about this? Or do you think that that's just unnecessary and we can just hear it somewhere else and, and just get Perrin directly into the dreams? No, I think it's important. Um, we, Moraine, until this book has always, in my opinion, has always kind of been this very strong, very powerful character. And then when we see her in book six, um, uh, not book six, sorry, chapter six, when she seems a little bit exasperated when she's talking about the, the prophecies. In my head, I always imagine Rosamond at this point being, you know, hair kind of a bit out of place, being quite almost exhausted and almost seeing this Aes Sedai facade kind of break down slightly. And this, I think, is important to kind of, have Perrin almost step away from Moraine because it kind of shows that she doesn't know everything. She doesn't always have the answers. And he's seeing a bit more of a, not a ruthless side, but someone that clearly has her own agenda. And if necessary, and if necessary, Perrin won't be a part of it. Yeah. I, I do like, I, I do like that aspect of it. Um, and it, you know, almost behind the, behind the scenes moment with Moraine, right? Like um, this is her pr in a private moment with her. I, I do like that aspect of, the, of leaving this here, even though it does have kind of serves very kind of exposition purposes. Um, I do like that. Uh, would you leave this in there, Todd? Would you do you think that you find that there's value to this interaction, this particular one? I love this scene because it shows Perrin slowly. He's, you know, he always talks about how he's slow to do things and people think he's slow and, and he's doing exactly that when he's talking to her he's slowly working through all of this you know it took hours for him to even go and talk to her and then when he does he's he's slowly working it through his mind how he's going to deal with this a, as time goes on um even to the point of asking if moran can protect him from the dreams like she does Lan. Um, right so i think this is a really cool scene because of of how he you know it Number one, he's kind of showing that uh, he's working through this. And number two, he's more and more kind of coming to an understanding with Moraine about um, their roles in, in what they're doing. And I think that's going to be where he starts getting his backbone around uh, other people, you know? Does that make yeah. sense? I mean, yeah, yeah. No, that, no I think that's... Um... I think that's that's true, and I and I like that, you know. I think each one of them needs this kind of relationship with Moraine. So wherever they put this in, I think we have to have this uh, more personal connection between her and each one. I mean, you see it more with Egwene, obviously initially. You see it more with Rand initially, but I think Matra needs it. And I think uh, we also need to see it with Perrin. So whether or not they do this early on in season one, not here. Or they use this as a good opportunity to kind of isolate this story about Perrin and really dig into that relationship. I, I like it. Um, and Rand almost does it like in a tantrum kind of way, and it drives me crazy the way he, he yeah. does it, where Perrin, you know, shows that he works through things slowly and, and figures out the best way to go. Yeah, no, and I agree. I hope they build on that. I, I like that she's able to give him some information. I don't think all the exposition about the wolf dreams is totally necessary. I think it can be discovered. I think the discovery aspect can be used here, you know, the show don't tell, uh, obviously, but um, I do like that, 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 it ha that we have that here. So uh, Mary, as far as this dream itself, Perrin's dream, do you find this one in particular important? Uh, no. You know, is more rains warning enough and would you move on or would you include this particular dream with Perrin? Well, the only real significance of this dream is it's, I think it's the first time we see Hopper. Um, yep. And yes, I know your favorite character is in this dream, Matt. I acknowledge that. <laughs> what? But, I don't know why uh, you think I was going to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, how long have I known you? <laughs> exactly. But um, 
Yeah, the this the dream itself could happen at any uh, any time, and the information that's shared in it could happen at any time. It doesn't need to happen here. It doesn't need to be triggered by this. Um, it it could just be after the the scenes in Jara, we uh, it, it switches over to another point of view, whether it be Rans or uh, or Nine Aves and Egwene's. It just uh, you know that's how you have to move the story along. I think the conversation between Maureen and Perrin can happen right after they let Gnome out of the uh, the 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 barn. There, you mm -hmm. don't have to have the hours in between of Perrin psyching himself up to talk to her. <laughs> they could have that conversation right there. Um, there's, you know, all of these scenes, Marcus Rutherford is going to uh, going to be putting on a show for us. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to uh, this this aspect and this these seem like definite moments that are going to be at least in a season two. Uh, he's going to come in really strong in this one. And I and I probably own the first section of this uh, this season, I hope. Uh, yeah. I, I want to point out for this dream. This is, I think, the first time we see Perrin really traveling around Teleron Riyadh. I believe I'm trying to think back if there's another moment where he's really traveling through Teleron other than just being, you know, um, within a dream or within another's dream, if you will. But we actually see him move and, and Hopper's almost serving as kind of a mentor to teach him to move through the dream at this point. Him seeing Lanfear in what appears to be Sean Chan or Teleron Riyadh's version of Sean Chan. Uh, here is that important? I don't think necessarily seeing land fear is that important. I think establishing danger in Teleron Riyadh is important. So, I, I the, the first scene where you see him where the shadow comes down and rips the guy's skin off, I want I want to believe Teleron Riyadh is extremely dangerous. So I think that's what needs to come across here. We need to believe Hopper, not just Perrin. I think the viewer needs to believe Hopper. So I do think that this particular dream of of many other dreams out there because it deals with Teleron Riyadh and because we start to get this connection with Hopper, I think this is a keep and they have to kind of have a scene like this. Um, Adam, are you in favor of this relationship being built with Hopper in Teleron Riyadh? Absolutely. Like Hopper is the reason why Perrin ultimately is what he is and will always be his spirit guide. Probably it's probably not the best way, but it's how I've always kind of viewed him. And whether you have Perrin's wolf dream as being a grassy plain and you've got Par you've got hopper either skulking in the grass or literally leaping in um, <laughs> like almost kind of having like a, a base point for perrin's wolf dream it kind of allows you that distinguishing between knowing that he's in the dream as opposed to being in a corridor or or anything like that but it's important it needs to stay and I would heartily disagree with anyone who thinks otherwise. Yeah, uh, Todd, where are you at here? Do you do you like the aspect of this being a good entry point into how dangerous Teleron Riyadh is and where they can really embed into Teleron Riyadh itself versus just dreams? Yeah, but, and I, yes, I, I like this scene, uh, even though I'm not a big fan of the dreams a lot of times, but uh, I, I like this, this dream sequence. Um, and I also like that it kind of, this is where Hopper starts teaching Perrin how to dream and how to not be a become a wolf in in real life. I think he he learns a lot of that from Hopper as they go along. Is there is there anyone in favor on this panel of cutting out this whole relationship with Hopper? Does anyone believe that they can do what is necessary with Perrin, uh, whether or not he learns it some other way? other than having this kind of uh, this guide, if you will. I, I understand there's repercussions later on with this, but is is Hopper key to Perrin's growth as an individual and the plot itself? I'm seeing lots of head shaking. Uh, Mary, you haven't I, haven't I haven't seen your head shake yet. Do we need the Hopper Perrin relationship in the Wheel of Time TV series? If we're keeping the world of dreams, I think yes. I, I was wrong in the past by saying that they could uh, cut the uh, ogier and not really lose much, <laughs> but they decided to keep the ogier. If they're going to keep the ogier, I, I think they would have a harder time cutting the world of dreams. And um, yeah, granted, it may be cheesy to have a, a, a talking wolf, a talking dream wolf, but hey, you know, that may be, this may be the baby Yoda of the Wheel of Time. <laughs> the Hopper is the baby Yoda 
I love it. That's fantastic. Uh, if you are still watching us on Facebook and Twitter, uh, thank you for watching this uh, first portion. Come over to YouTube. You'll, this uh, sneak peek, if you went, went a little bit longer today, it will end. Come join us on YouTube. Get in chat. Let us know what you think about this idea. Do we have to have Perrin and Hopper in the Wheel of Time TV series? I'm seeing a lot of reactions in chat. Let's talk about those here uh, just a second. Yeah, and if, and if you're here again for the first time or you're, you're here watching us and you're enjoying this, please like this video just so other fans can find it. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Teleron Riot is essential. I know I'm not saying we have to cut Hopper. Uh, I want to bring this up because this idea of, of them going through and streamlining this because we're not going to get every single plot in the books this is a plot that they have to be asking themselves, right? Rafe and his team must be asking this question, and that's why I want to put it to fandom, which is, what is it that we get from this relationship? What is it that Perrin gets, and what is it that's driving us to the end that Robert Jordan planned, and is this vital to that end? Is it vital to Perrin's build, uh, growth as a character? Is it vital to the, the, the light preparing for the, the last battle? And is it, is it vital to other growth, uh, you know, other characters and certain particular important plots? I think that's what has to be asked and know that they're going to and, and make your case in, in that regard. So, you know, Adam, what's your case that this is vital to parents' growth? The Battle of Teleran Riyadh at the end, I think, is this is the starting point which ultimately leads to his complete ownership of the wolf dream and everyone's favorite or at least my favorite Perrin and Negrade interaction when he stops Balefire and she is gobsmacked. He's like, well, it's just the wolf dream. And he just kind of walks off and always possibly the best mic drop moment in the entire series. <laughs> I think Perrin, right. Andrew Berenson made a good point in chat that if you were going to have the only other way if you were to cut Hopper would be to use Eyeless, which again would be too much like the wise ones teaching a grain or even a grain in the tower learning what little she does in dreaming from Beren. so i think hopper and the wolf dream needs to stay and whether or not you see that more regularly and you kind of see his power within the wolf dream grow larger early on because then that may potentially move plot points and you think that the Wolf Dream and Teleron Riyad are two very different things until you get to that perfect moment. And then it's something which has been building up and building up and then all of a sudden it's, wow. Yeah, I, I agree. And and again, it just reminded me, we told everybody at the beginning, but if you, you've just come in on this, uh, this is a live adaptation. We're talking about the importance of certain characters and plots and characterization and, and certain particular scenes. There's going to be spoilers here. Taylor can flash the spoiler banner up one more time just to remind us. There's going to be spoilers here. So if you don't want any of the books to be spoiled, don't uh, continue listening, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, I, I loved Andrew's comment. Like, keep Hopper drop Fail. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, no, no. What were you going to say? Keep Hopper Andrew? drop Slayer. Oh, see, okay, we're no. not there yet, but that is Slayer, the Slayer discussions coming in the Shadow Rising. That's a big yes. discussion that has to happen. We're not going to have it right now, but all yes, right. these are all questions that we have to answer. Um, I don't want to take the whole show and make it into this question of Perrin and Hopper, but I think that this is important for us to ask as fans, and maybe we'll do, maybe we'll come back after we do these live adaptations and we'll address specific questions because this is a fun one. Um, before we move on, Todd, did you have anything to say about this particular question that hasn't been addressed by Adam here or are you good to move forward? Uh, let's, uh, let's keep going. Okay, let's do it. Um, this last piece of this chapter, Rand, we get Rand and he kills some Darkhounds, it appears, and he continues fleeing. I'm assuming we're all in favor of seeing some montage of Rand and all the craziness that he's going through just to stay alive. I think they can do that throughout. I don't think it, they have to use this particular moment, um, how it happens it's, itself. Or do you think we have to see Rand, is there the, we have to see Rand killing a dark hound. Is that important to, you know, or is it just important that we just see him killing basically uh, people or, or having, being attacked or in some way protecting himself uh, you know, as he goes? I Dark hounds, I, they, they weren't really used in the series. I don't know why you would need a, a, yet another flavor of Shadow Spawn, why it couldn't just be an, a, like a Murdral or a Trolloc. Um, you could easily do that and keep you know those as being the, uh, the, the bad guy grunts that are easily killed with the first appearance of Balefire. 
Uh, but yeah, I, I, I like the montage idea of cutting Duran running and um, killing Shadow Spawn on his way. I don't think it needs to be a dark hand. I think it could easily be a Trolloc or, or a Murdral. Uh, but do we need to have him using Balefire? Okay, this is an interesting one. Uh, I want to ask this question. This version of Dark Hounds, uh, are we cutting them out of our adaptation? <laughs> are we cutting Dark, the, the, the initial version of Dark Hounds? Uh, are there, is there anyone in favor of keeping the Dark Hounds as we know them right in this moment in the books? Uh, Adam, are you in favor of, do we need another flavor of Shadow Spawn right now? Or, uh, you know, so are, are you a keeper cut of this particular Shadow Spawn in the books at this moment? I will cut the Shadow Spawn at this, uh, cut the Dark Hounds at this moment. They are unnecessary. I agree we should keep the Bale Fire. And I would probably almost play on Rand's or having a, an element of guilt coming through this. So while he's running, because he couldn't do anything with the battle, this is almost like him trying to, while he's being chased, trying to do what he can. And yeah. I would probably vocalize his internal monologue as well, because it would add to the level of madness that we're starting to see yeah personally okay yeah no I, I agree i mean there is an aspect of the wolves here that come into play but i think later on especially we can get the um advanced version of dark hounds in other words they can bring them in later um they're unnecessary right in this moment and i would i probably agree with that especially because they don't come into play with perrin as far as i remember at this time so I agree, just having a montage of Rand. Uh, so I want to just remind everybody, this is a live call-in talk show. We don't have any screening today, so I'll be bringing you into the show immediately. Like when, As you call and you come in, you'll just come right into the show. That'll be fun. <laughs> um, and so, But yeah, you can give us a call if you disagree with anything from these first. I don't know. We made it through three chapters so far. <laughs> I always think we're going to get through like 15, and we're like through three at this point. So, But this was an important discussion. This whole section about Perrin and Wolves is a big piece, and so I really wanted to dig into it. But yeah, you can give us a call at 1313-TALK-WATT or 1313-825-5968 if you have an opinion about this or what we're about to discuss. So we'll leave those call lines open for the next half an hour. If you want to, you know, again, join the conversation other than in chat, we'll, we'll pull, we'll pull stuff in from there too. So let's jump into chapter 10. Finally, we're away from, you know, we, we've finally gotten back to, uh, the group with Egwene, Nynaeve, Elaine, Varen, Huron, and Matrim. So this encounter, right? We have this whole chapter 10 about the encounter basically with the white cloaks. That's what this serves, right? They're coming in, you're kind of getting a feeling for, you know, they're concerned about Matt and getting him to the, you know, White Tower. They, they see it, they're almost there. They're, they've come away from this whole experience with the Sean Chan, you know, so they've almost arrived. And then we have this moment with the White Cloaks and obviously Dane Bornhalt. So uh, I want to start with you, Mary, and we'll work up to the top to Todd. Uh, this question about the white cloaks again, right? There's another white cloak question. Is this scene itself, is it important to have another moment with the white cloaks uh, and, and Dane, you know, and, and make sure that we build up this conflict between basically the Edmonds Fielders and the Bornhalts, if you will? Uh, do, you, do you like this aspect or do we need to get, to get to the Tarvalon and move on? Uh, do, I, do I like seeing the white cloaks owned every day of the week and twice on Sunday? <laughs> um, but do we need this scene? Probably not. Um, it's, you know, it, I, I don't know what it adds. Uh, I mean, other than depth and it shows uh, Queen's mental state at that point in time, which is still very damaged from her recent uh, experiences. Uh, it, but does it really add anything? No. So, so I think it could be safely cut. Yeah, you just brought up one thing I want to ask uh, Adam and Todd about this. That is a good point, which is um, this does have some characterization aspects when it comes to Egwene and how she's feeling about the experience that just happened with the Sean Chan and her, you know, her drive to never be captured again and never be controlled in such a way. This does this does illustrate it in ways that it's more difficult to do in the white tower. Uh, and we haven't seen anything from Egwene since what happened. So I do like that this does dig us back into Egwene's psyche a little bit. Uh, Adam, are you in favor in that regard or from a characterization standpoint with anybody in this party of keeping this, or would you just get them to the white tower and have that show up in conversations and such? I think the characterization is important. Egwene is essentially traumatized. I would argue that she's got, 
quite a high level of almost PTSD at this moment. And it's just as much a, a defense mechanism to protect herself as it is an example of how strong she's grown since she's left the White Tower. And particularly when it comes to Earth, as we know that will come into effect when she changes the the change to Quindard uh, later on in the series. I think it also kind of adds that little bit of underlying tension in regards to Andor's relationship with the White Tower, given that Elaine has been gone and Morghese is True. having yeah. the... Um, is almost splitting her connection with the tower, but then that is equally served by Galad and Gowan in the tower itself. So I feel that bit could be cut. Um, but we all love Dane Bornhold, particularly because it hurt <laughs> us. So. Right. Yeah, no, that you're bringing up a good point here. Uh, the mentioning the PTSD aspect of this, I'm um, seeing chat kind of mention that too. Todd, uh, do you like that? I mean, are the reasons that Mary and Adam thrown out here, is, is there something else we're also missing from the scene that you think is important? Or do you like keeping this for the reasons been expressed? I think that one of the things that I had noticed about this scene is this is the first time that Varen steps on him. And, and I really yeah. like, like her doing that. Um, I think that was pretty cool because she's always been kind of flighty and out there. And now all of a sudden she smokes all three of them. And uh, then she does it again when they get to the, to the tower itself. And, and I think that's pretty cool to see. Yeah. And there's, there's also the aspect here um, of the dagger with Matt um that we can't forget that and varon warns them once they get to the white tower like you got to be careful around that thing <laughs> you, know, you know um and they've been right they've been bringing matt and uh to the white tower uh so amping up the feelings that Egwene has had at this point um showing that there have been changes i think from this event with the sean chan and everything i i think is important so i i do like it for that i i, I do like that aspect of it and varon like you said yes yeah um there's a remark. I don't think it happens here. I think it happens a little bit later. But Egwene says it's the first time Ver she's seen Varen angry. Yeah. Um, and showing that, like, yeah, I think it just she wasn't gonna. She's not gonna. She told her not to say anything, and she said, "I wouldn't." Mm, nope. She said, <laughs> yeah. She wasn't gonna say anything. Yeah, that's interesting. So I, I feel like we're kind of leaning. Uh, I'm leaning to, towards keeping this. I, I think this is important. I, I, I like the scene. Getting to. I, I think rushing to the White Tower would be a little bit anticlimactic after everything that's happened to this group. So I do like a little vignette here where we have this moment uh, and the white cloaks definitely provide like an, you know, a two dimensional, <laughs> you know, character to just throw a rock against and, and have this moment. Uh, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Mary's in, I think we're all thumbs up on keeping the scene. Uh, this one's tough. It's going to get tough uh, cutting a lot of these. I thought we we're gonna be able to cut a lot more from these first ones, but Perrin uh, important piece there, and Egwene's you know important character building it doesn't have to be a, a huge you know amount of time, but I do like this one. Uh, before we jump into now uh, chapter eleven and actually get to the White Tower, I do see some callers, so let let's bring them into the show. Hey, welcome to the Dusty Wheel. How you doing? Hey, good. Thanks for taking my call. Good. Who's this? Uh, my name is Matthew Matthew Noble. Nice, uh, Matthew. Been watching Welcome. your show, but first time calling in. Awesome, Welcome. awesome. Wait, well, we appreciate it. Great name, great name. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, what's your thought or question about what we've what we've covered so far? Uh, I just I really want to talk about dark hounds. If that's okay, uh, yeah. I know we went over a lot since that was brought up, but I just feel like you can't not include dark hounds in this adaptation, even at the Dragon Reborn. I know you guys are probably thinking it'll be included later. But I think my biggest uh, fear when I was reading The Dragon Reborn was the Dark Hounds. They, they scared me. I mean, I wasn't really afraid of Trollocs. Um, you know, they were scary in the first book, but uh, I, was, I was more afraid of the, the Dark Hounds than anything else in, in The Dragon Reborn. Uh, and I think that fear would be a good thing to keep in if they can make it, uh, you know, appropriately scary and and driving uh some of the fear that you know i think Rand felt yeah no it's, that's an interesting uh, perspective I, I like that that uh the fear that you sense was different than that I, there is a case to be made for a variety of shadow spawn and maybe it was the way that robert jordan implemented this first mention of dark hounds i just didn't like and so maybe if if they really embedded in the dark hounds and really show that rand is being chased by them and how dangerous they are and just how different they are 
Uh, because the way that Rand is like, oh, there's basically this, you know, he's like, basically I killed this dog. <laughs> you know, it didn't seem like when I go back and when I went back and read it, I, I wasn't as scared this time. Later on, I felt what you felt, which is when we get Dark Hounds later, I, and maybe it's even later in The Dragon Reborn, I do start to sense more of a fear aspect there. Adam, do you think it's important from uh, that aspect of, you know, everyone's going to feel fear about the shadow a little bit different and having some diversity early on in the seasons about what tools the Dark One has would be actually an important reason to, to keep them. Yeah, I could see where, where Matt's kind of coming with that, but they need to be scary. They need to be something which is going to be muscled, snarling. I want to I want to see the corruption of the wolves in them. So they've got to be something which is going to... Maybe if you have it through a couple of the episodes, particularly with the wolves after the the battle then you could start having the sensing of of something wrong and then having them appear might work then so yeah Yeah, it's a good concept i I like the idea of almost almost having rand wonder if he should turn back and then realize he can't because he has dark hounds on his you know what i mean like this moment of maybe i made the wrong choice and maybe you know maybe i i can't do this alone and then having no option to go back but being driven forward by the hounds could be an interesting aspect to the use of them uh yeah great 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 uh, idea matt I, I like the idea of that of of keeping them in there for those reasons i uh, i do have a question for you and this, this is, <laughs> i don't know why i'm doing this this is bad because <laughs> this is always like controversial okay a couple episodes ago we recommended uh, cutting the blowing of the horn from from the Wheel of Time TV show. Uh, are you in favor of this idea or are you against this idea? Uh, you got to blow the horn. I don't, I don't <laughs> okay. think you can cut it. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I, I knew it. I, I don't know why I keep on bringing this one up, but it's fun to ask fans, uh, especially if I haven't heard from them, what they think about this. This is what drove the hashtag Let Barney Blow. And this is just a fun thing to to query people about. So, hey, Matt, thank you so much for calling in. Appreciate your viewership and appreciate you being a first-time caller. And have a good afternoon, okay? Great. Thanks. Enjoy the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank Bye-bye. you, everybody. Bye. Yeah, you gotta, it, you, you gotta quit with that, Matt. I, <laughs> I, I oh, went from twenty five thousand Twitter followers to two hundred and twenty. So <laughs> I'm gonna just keep going. Sorry, I have to. I have to, <laughs> dude. I have to drive this one. This one was fun. This was fun. Let's bring in our second caller. Hey, welcome Hello. to Dusty Wheel. This how is you Andrew doing? Andrew Barrington. Hey, Andrew, how, how you doing? Uh, we're doing great. We're doing great. Um, Two th- I, one point I want to go back to that conversation about Lan- I mean Moraine explaining to Perrin. I did. I remembered at some point, and I don't remember when it was, where he was saying the significance of the dream and when he got burned. I don't know if that's later on or that's now. Is that in that scene? I don't. Say- I remember, remember, remember there's now. a point where Perrin almost gets a little burn and then he tells Moraine about the significance of the dream and she kind of looks at him and says, you know, this is, you know, basically, you know, she kind of bores holes in them kind of that, that way. And then basically he asks, well, are you going to heal me? And she says, no. Does that, let that be a warning to you? Was that in the, was that in the earlier part of uh, the Dragon Reborn? I, I, I don't remember. That, was that this conversation or was that a later scene that we get to in this book? It wasn't this conversation, so it must because uh, I okay. kind of I have it. It wasn't the, this particular wasn't one. This one, no. Okay, then never mind then, because that, that I was just going to say that that scene probably has to stay as well. That conversation, so you got to kind of have to balance this where he's got to wind up talking to her twice. Yeah, no, you I don't know right, if exactly. you kind of make that within one scene. If you combine them into both one scenes, you could probably do that, but you know it. it depends on how repetitive you want to be where he's talking to her. I just think that that second aspect of her, you know, him basically saying, you know, her, you know, finally asking to be, you know, after sort of going against Moraine and saying, Hey, well, can you heal me? And she goes, no. Yeah. I think, I think you could, I guess you'll get to that later. Yeah, but you could, I mean, you could, um, Basically, you could have Perrin go and talk to her after his dream. What I mean by that is, right, he could wake up from yeah. his dream and it could drive him to want to understand more of what he just experienced. And he could, yeah, come, I in, think that... he could come in with some kind of, you know, light injury and have her be like, yeah. this, let this be a lesson for you. You know, you need to know, like, this is a dangerous place. And 
And so, no, I won't. Like you could, you could kind of mesh that in and really amp up that, you know, parents' experience in that. So yeah, that's an interesting idea. I, I like that a lot. Are you in favor, Andrew? I'm kind of curious. I didn't wasn't I didn't follow chat. Are you in favor of this uh, idea of leaving the Egwene scene in there? Do you want to see kind of this you know, um, PTSD? Event? I think that I think what you the only thing I think you need is I think you the the white cloaks as who who they attack have to be different. Maybe it's they fear for the lives from a mob earlier on. Maybe it's she wakes up in a dream and sort of, you know, recounts a dream to Elaine and Nynaeve. And then you have the warning from Farron. I just don't think you need the white, that her facing the white cloaks. Gotcha. Yeah. That's I, the I, one aspect I don't think. I would agree with that. They, they should, they, and I'm sure they will feel freedom to basically, um, decide how to show those. And I think you could show that in a dream itself. Um, uh, I think the visceral nature of the white cloaks and it really raising the stakes for her of like no one, no person's going to take me. I like that aspect, but yeah, I, I think you're right. You could maybe. have, you could have other events. I maybe, I, maybe I'm just a little bit too shy of going too far into the dreams, always driving. And I, the I guess the, the only other thing response. is, it, I guess you can keep it if you have her get captured by the white cloaks in in book one. If you because then at least you she's been captured again. She'll say no. No, but if you, for some reason, change it so that she's not captured by the white cloaks. Right, right, right. And they yeah. just, that's a good, you can't have it. That's an excellent call out. I, I would say that that actually makes a more definitive connection to these two scenes that you have to have. So I'm even now yeah. more in favor of the scene. Good reminder from the eye of the world. If they're going to keep that in season one, this scene has to happen. Uh, and, it, one, and it needs to be pretty epic. I one think. last one last point where, because I know you guys didn't get this when you recreated the last scene in um, the um, Great Hunt. You have to have the scene where um, Min sees um, Landfair and she basically tells her, I'm Landfair. Yeah, we didn't go back and do that, that one. Yeah, that was the, I, remember, I remember that coming up and I meant to go back when we did our first part one. Um, Min and Landfair, uh, maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll use this as an excuse in the next one to go back and really narrow in the- <laughs> Not that I really like men in land fear or anything or want to talk about them always. <laughs> um, so, no, hey, Andrew, as always, thank you very much for calling in. Great questions, and we'll talk to you soon. You're welcome. Okay, bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. Yeah, we have one more call, and then we can jump back into our uh, adapting the uh, Tarvalon and uh, what they experienced there. So let's take this last caller. Hey, welcome to the Dusty Wheel. How you doing? Hey, guys. Carolina. Carolina, how you doing? Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, great show as always. Thanks hey, for that. Thanks. thanks. Uh, so what's uh, what have we either covered or not covered yet that you wanted to ask about or make a comment on? Yeah, um, this is kind of a broader scope uh, Dragon Reborn question. It's two parts, uh, which is the first part is, um, do you think Rand should be as absent from this season or the episodes mm-hmm. regarding the Dragon Reborn as he is in the books? And if not then what would you show of this story? And if so, explain yourself. So. Okay, so I like that first question. Um, and then maybe we start there. Mary, I want to give you an opportunity here. Um, step back, broader theme. Do you want to see Rand more, or do you think that, that this is perfect for TV? That is a very good question. Um, this, I mean, he is, like you noticed, Carolina, very absent from a lot of on-screen time in this book. Uh, I think it works, though. Uh, even, you know, the book has his name. It is about him. The entire <laughs> thing is about him, but it's 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 moving everybody else through their plot lines as he's uh, traveling halfway across the continent, well, more than halfway across the continent, to get to the, uh, the end location. Uh, I... <laughs> I don't know. I think we would be going too far afield from the books if we changed that too significantly. And I'm always hesitant to do that. Yeah, I'm, mm-hmm. uh, I'm, a, I, I'm kind of a, a agree there. And we'll, maybe we can dig into the panel here uh, also on that question. But maybe you had, a, you had a two-parter, Carolina. What were you thinking for your second? What was the second part of that question? Uh, second part was if we do see him, um, what would you show? And it, but she kind of you already answered also the if you don't see them, you know, what well, would you show? But, you but, that but that's but that's a good question. So Adam, let's go down this road really quick um, with mm-hmm. with Carolina, which is let's say they did change it. What would be the impact or the importance to changing it, and how would you make that an impactful change to the TV series? It's a difficult one because I've always seen this kind of 
it is this is kind of Rand's journey to Tia. This is always how I've kind of viewed it as everyone will end in Tia and it's the journeys which are important given that we focused on Rand so much. This book is about him kind of claiming the title and I think that is enough. If I was going to do anything else, I would possibly include more of Mazarin Tain and almost kind of show whether or not he's following a procession of Mazarin being captured and he's wanting to see this other false dragon who I would portray as being very different to Loghain. This man would be charismatic, calculating, not coming across as mad in any way, shape or form and being this very charismatic leader and possibly having the play of how we've seen Loghain as opposed to how we see Mazarin. But I don't know what else we could do to include it, which wouldn't make it seem like it's just filler, if that makes sense, Carolina. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, no, that's yeah, a good yeah. question. The, the, the concept of it being filler. Do you have an idea here, Todd? Like, uh, beyond just keeping the books as they are, is there something that wouldn't be a filler that no. could be something that we could change about the books where we'd really focus on Rand uh, more than it than it does? I don't think at this point we need to focus on Rand. I, I like the idea of him just being there in spots um, because he's not really doing a whole, I mean, he is, but he's trying to get to tier. And this gives us time while he's getting to tier to kind of flesh out the other characters. So you learn a lot about, I mean, uh, we're getting into some stuff about Matt and we're, we're learning about Perrin and, and there's a lot that happens in this book to other people that even though Rand is having an effect on the world right now, he's trying to do something else and eventually they all get there. So I, I kind of like the idea of just leaving it like it is. Yeah, no, I'm, it's interesting. I'm seeing a lot of uh, a lot of that. Well, Caroline, did, did something come to mind where you thought before we let you go? Was there something in your mind that you're like, this could actually be a really good modification to how it's done and actually include Rand more? Um, I don't know if I really. I mean, I, I definitely agree that I like the idea of him not being there as much. Only reason I definitely wanted to ask is because I think shows have a hard time not putting their showrunner. Right. in every episode <laughs> right right. but but i also think if they were going to do it i think i'd i'd still want it to be kind of like that dabble kind of pace of we see him on his journey where you see him in uh taverns and the way that uh, somebody even put it in chat actually seeing the way the tavir in nature kind of starts to affect the world because it seems to be growing as he grows towards here just kind of seeing the effect of him more on everything around him and him yeah. seeing that yeah, I'm absolutely in favor of that. Um, and as we go through and adapt this, uh, I'm going to be calling that out a lot more, which is I want to see his descent into paranoia and just, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think this is something that sets him up for later of just like how much he just does not trust people um, in general, yeah. trust what he thinks is real, right? He doubting what he sees and always questioning yeah. the, you know, the motivations of people around him, even when he believes it, it is them just questioning who they're working for and, and such, you know, I think they need to show that aspect. And so hopefully that does come across in the, in the show. So, uh, Carolina, thank you so much for calling in. Great. Yeah. Great. Uh, great, uh, thought to take us down. Uh, it's interesting to see everyone kind of push against that. So it seems like something that I would say, at least among fans, Robert Jordan did something right here. The, because it seems like fans really have, holding on to this and really believe in the choice that he made creatively here, which is, which was a difficult one, right? I'm sure it's like, but Rand is the Dragon Reborn and we see him very little. So I love it. Hey, Carolina, hopefully uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you again. We'll hear from you again. Hey, thank you so much. Bye guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Yeah, this is a, it's a great question. And I'm sure one they'll struggle with when they get here. Uh, I, at least for me, I see, I see uh, season two of the show really integrating a lot of pieces of the, the Great Hunt and the Dragon Reborn. Like that's how I would, because you can't, right? You you can't have, <laughs> you can't have one book a season in like that's not going to happen. I, I mean, I could, I could see it <laughs> in the sense yeah. of as a fan, I'd love it, but uh, in reality, about, I could see him, I could see him meshing a lot of that happens in the Great Hunt and the Dragon Reborn. And this this story is about the Dragon Reborn, but it's about the Dragon Reborn at, as everybody talks about him, 
more than it's the dragon reborn doing his things you know that so yeah it, yeah that's a good point yeah yeah that's a that's a great point um and I like that. I, I hope that the, they do actually embed in that idea. I think Robert Jordan did something very right that would translate really well to TV. Um, and it gives us a chance to get to know everybody else uh, much more, which I think is good. Uh, I want to I'm bring up one quote from Varen before we move on to chapter 11. At the very end of chapter 10, she says, Now you must truly be on your guard. Now the real danger begins. I love that, right? Like they've just come from Toman Head, the Sean Chan right? The, the, Egwene has just been a captive. Like, they've just traveled through portal stones, and Rand has been named the Dragon Reborn, and they just ran into White Cloaks, and, you know, Matrim is, like, you know, all these things have happened. And here, I love that Varen calls out, like, yeah, yeah, all that other stuff, not important. Now you must truly be on guard. Now the real danger begins. Uh, I love that call out. I hope that they, that's a line they include in the show. It's so impactful. So, uh, Getting to the White Tower, chapter 11, we have this whole kind of like, they get there, they basically break up into groups. Varen goes to see the Amarlin, and Shariam uh, basically assigns three novices to just, or, you know, her three helpers to take everybody into their places. Do we need to see them kind of get into the Tarvalon and have this kind of whole scene uh, of, of getting to the tower or can after the White Cloaks things happen, uh, would it even make sense to people that are watching? Like, okay, that happened and now they're sitting in their rooms waiting. Like, if you just saw the next scene was like they were being guarded by people in their rooms waiting, is that enough? Or do we have to have this chapter 11? Uh, maybe let's start with you, Todd. Do you think something happens here from a plot perspective that we need? Or can we just fast forward to what happens in chapter 12? Um the biggest thing that it shows is how fast news is traveling because even Varen says that they're probably already going to know because the rumors travel fast travel faster than they did um i'm just I, i'm not a big fan of this scene I, I think we can shorten it quite a bit um up you know it's just kind of like the wandering into town getting into the tar Valley, and then it kind of hits when they get to the or Sherium is there. So that first part, it's just descriptions of outside of Tarvalon and inside. So I'm okay with kind of shortening it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's interesting. It's kind of just another moment like, you're at the tower, remember, be quiet. Right. You're at right. the tower, you don't have any rights to do anything, just listen. You're at the tower, go wait. Uh, uh, do you see anything here, Mary, that needs to be, or can we, can we, we have them run off from the White Cloaks basically and see them basically get to Tarvalon and then fast forward? Or do we need to see this kind of set up for what happens in chapter 12? Do we need to see it? I'm not sure. If you want to show that Tarvalon is the real danger that Varen has mentioned, you'd need to, you have to do more than just have them appear in their rooms. There has to be a little bit more to it than that. Um, Good point. Does it have to be much? Not, not really. We've already had a grand entrance into Tarvalon. We did that uh, during the Great Hunt and uh, that works out all right. Uh, they're, they're coming back home. They thought they were coming to a place of safety and it's not, it's actually worse. You got to be able to, to show that. And, you know, you need a reason for, uh, Huron to leave. Uh, so you got to show that as well. And, uh, we can get rid of the map though. I'm all for that. Uh, <laughs> don't need the map. Don't need the map. <laughs> and, uh, wow. I, okay. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> we're here. You brought us here, Mary. That's fine. So, uh, thumbs up in chat get rid of the map or do we need the map okay <laughs> hashtag th throw the map away uh, or hashtag <laughs> keep the map or need the map uh that's that's awesome <laughs> i want to know I, that I, I'm, a, I, I'm a big map geek, <laughs> but yeah yeah this is this yeah uh yeah 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 <laughs> uh, so yeah, this interesting point. You, you you bring up a good point to try to save this moment. I don't want it to be this kind of Harry Potter, you know, Harry and his crew come back and then, you know, I don't know. There's something Harry Potter-esque about this scene that I don't like. So I, I, I would want to see them do it differently. But you do make a good point, knowing that the Tarvalon, we, they've just been told it's dangerous, mm -hmm. amping up that anxiety before the Amarlin moment and definitely having some scenes in, Tar, you know, in the White Tower uh, what's happening there, you know, giving them reasons to fear it, uh, I think is good. Uh, Adam, would you agree, like, we need to amp up this anxiety about the White Tower itself, or do we need kind of what happens in Chapter 11 to really make sense of everything else? 
it, it needs to be amped up. And kind of going back to, to Verin's comment, it always makes me think, and something which I think would be quite nice, is if we can somehow throw in Min's line from Chapter 6 of if there's no safety in Tarvalon, there's no safety anywhere. And I feel that would be an interesting dichotomy between the two. Given how Aegwane has been treated and how she's now feeling since leaving Tarvalon, I would almost, if I was filming it, I would almost have them coming in through a route which is almost like the the tradesman side of Tarvalon. So things are a bit dirtier, a bit grimier, still the, the shining city that it is, but almost kind of showing a, a visual jadedness, which would be a good way. So Aegwane, while she thinks that it is this place of refuge and safety. She knows that she's never yep. going to be quite safe to, safe again. Yeah, I do. I do like that idea uh, for sure. Um, is that Todd? Are you, is that where you, I think basically? If you've heard anything to change your mind here, or do you think this is right? We just uh, we amp it up, and uh, we don't necessarily need it word for word, but we just kind of amp up the danger feeling before we get into chapter twelve. Yep, I'm I'm good with that. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I had. To... <laughs> I, uh, Colonel Reads and Travel said, hashtag colorize the map. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, chapter 12. Varen reports the dragon's uh, rebirth, basically. She meets up with the Amarlin. You have this section. Uh, you know, maybe we've kind of gotten into the White Tower here. They're there. We have this, you know, moment between Varen and uh, Suan. What is the takeaway here of chapter 12 for you, Adam, as far as the TV series is concerned? You know, obviously, Varen's bringing the horn. She's reporting about things. You know, is this important that we have this kind of moment between them? Or can we just kind of know that Varen, this happened, and we just go immediately basically to when um, the punishments are happening and we get the girls going directly to Swan? Like, is this... Is there anything here that's really key to plot characterization or anything for the TV series, or can we just fast forward it a bit? No, I think we need this. I think given the the opulence of the Aes Sedai chambers, I want to see Sawan as being a simpler woman. And I feel that how Jordan describes the furniture that she brings in, I think that's important to her character. We also have the very ruthless side to Swan coming through with kind of going, well, if Matt dies, someone could sound, someone else could sound the horn. And sure. that's why we need to keep the sort the, the horn being blown at the end of <laughs> <laughs> You're making a case. Like, you you went back. And <laughs> so I think uh, 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 we need it, but also because therein is the what, these are the only two that know where the horn is. And obviously given certain allegiances of these characters, I feel that that is something which does need to, to stay in as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, there is something to be said for that, which is if they're going to keep the horn and we're going to be talking about that, this does give a chance to understand why she has the horn and that it's at the tower and it does give some characterization uh, capabilities with Swan. So it's an interesting piece. Um, and before we kind of move forward then from this, uh, you know, Mary, are you in favor of keeping this the way it is? I think it could be combined. Uh, the meeting with Varen can happen with the meeting with the, with Nynaeve and Gwyn and Elaine. That could all happen at the same time. Yeah, you could. You could certainly kind of do not have this whole, like, they go to their rooms and then they talk about how much they're not going to take on their punishments. I, I like that idea. I, I, let's streamline it. Let's put it all in one. Todd, are you in favor of that idea, just streamlining this and having it kind of like the whole group goes? Uh, uh, is Matt going to blow the horn? Uh, in our adaptation, Matt has yes. not blown the horn. Yes, he has. <laughs> <laughs> we only have four here. There's, I'm, I'm not opening this up to a retcon <laughs> today. <laughs> Maybe well, later. So as of now, in our adaptation... I gave Suana the chance to be party to the retcon last week, last time. She didn't do it, so we've already been down that road. <laughs> um, I think uh, what's cool to me in this scene is when Varen tells Swan that uh, Rand proclaimed himself. She's relieved, you know, and that's something that I wouldn't think you would expect. To the world's getting ready to end, and she's like, "Okay, you know, all right, we're all good," you know. So that that to me is kind yeah. of a, a, a cool little tidbit in the scene that that happens 
And yeah, no, that's Matt, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, since Matt's not blowing the horn, we don't have to go into all the other. <laughs> in our adaptation yeah yeah no but you you do bring up a good point which is this is i mean someone brought this up i think adam you brought this up earlier about time there is a there's an opportunity here to really focus in and talk about this nature of like this being like this part of the plan has now been an, is now in effect right they've released the dragon reborn upon the world and having this kind of be this culmination moment for at least for it to hit with Swan and being the center of power here in Tarvalon and that, that knowledge of we don't know what's happening to Taim and all these other things. So for it to be established in this moment, I think is a good is a good uh, is, a, is a good reason to keep this particular scene. But I like streamlining it and not having the girls necessarily go back to their rooms and wait. And, you know, let's just get let's get to Tarvalon. Let's see that there's like danger and anxiety going on. Let's have them meet the Amerlin. Uh, that all works really well. Now we have just uh, five or 10 minutes more. So I, I want to, I want to give the opportunity for one more question of change. And for those watching, I'm not saying this is, should happen. I just think we need to ask the question. Um, should the girls be the black Aja hunters in the TV show. Is that an important aspect to the book's overall arc with when it comes to Egwene and Elaine and Nynaeve? Do they have to be Black Aja hunters in the White Tower? And if so, what is the key aspects of that characterization and that plot that, that need to show up on the TV show? And I'll give Adam kind of the first jump into this one. I think they need to be the hunters. It sets up particularly going down the line, Nynaeve's antagonism with Megedion, which I feel is important. And the whole, I think it's also Swan, literally saying, I think she says about, you know, it's a thin it's a thin reed to grab. And these are the only three people that she knows adamantly that she can trust. And she's been in a position for the last 20 years where the only other person that she's been able to trust has been out in the world. And I think she is just kind of utilizing the tools that she has their floor tools absolutely and if she had other ways i think she would use them but yes i think so they need to stay okay so as far as and i've seen this show up in chat like what else would they be doing if not <laughs> um you know i uh, i think there is a way to streamline this potentially where because we if this makes sense we get the we get the gray man, right? Like there's still danger in the white tower, right? It's a dangerous place. We still have a Gwen later on. We're not going to get to it in this part of the adaptation, but she gets the ring, right? She gets into Teleron Riyadh. Um, and you know, it's not totally necessary. If you remember uh, that we have to actually have that aspect that drives them versus their desire to find the black Aja, I guess. But anyways, I, there, there's this, they have to be the Black Aja hunters. I don't think it stops other things from necessarily happening, but I, I can see a reason for just keeping it there because it makes some sense of it. Uh, Mary, are you in favor of keeping the, you know, uh, Swan tasks these people, these are the only people she can trust, and so she tasks them with finding the Black Aja? Um, I think it needs to be kept. Uh, there's one thing about this whole thing that really annoyed me, um, reading it when I read it as a, you know, a young teenager, uh, was, you know, Elaine and uh, Egwene and I, they were, they did what they were supposed to do. They followed the rules of the tower and they still, um, you know, got screwed over. And then when they came uh, by following Landon, and they were supposed to, they had no reason not to. And then they come back and, you know, they're punished for doing exactly what they were supposed to do. And they're not even allowed to talk about why, uh, you know, they were in the right. And it's one of those, you know, if I'm going to get screwed either way, I'm just going to do things my own way and screw you all. <laughs> uh, and that that was me in my teenagers and in my 20s and my 30s and as I keep going I'm still that way I guess but um, yeah I would be a total naive in this situation I am going to be the hunter I don't care if I'm going up against the biggest bads uh, there shouldn't be any bad I, black Aja, there shouldn't be any bad I said I they're supposed to be the ones that are there to protect us and to help us and yes you have to be a little wary about them but they're not supposed to be uh, dark friends and yet they are and that is wrong and I'm going to do something about it we need that yeah, I, I think, and I and I saw Carolina put this idea in chat. I, I think you can get, 
this drive that they have, right? You add Teleron Riyadh in, you add their fear for their friends, right? And you add in the, the danger that they're in, in the White Tower. And so not only the danger that they're in, and, and have them actually drive this aspect of it um, towards them leaving again and finding a good reason to do so without necessarily Swan. I don't know. There's something, again, this comes down to um, something Harry Potterish about this, like, who can Swan trust? Two people she doesn't know very well from a village uh, out in, you know, it, it's just one of these like, and she knows nothing about them. And she has reason to suspect that maybe they're not telling the entire truth. And they don't even, they're not even like sworn to the oath rod, but these are the only two people she can trust. Uh, this aspect, and it didn't actually seem totally necessary to what ends up happening because I think there's other ways to get there. So that's there's why I wanted to bring this plot, one up. There is know? a bit of plot armor to it, but then again, Swan's also dealing with the fact that 13 sisters just expose themselves as being Black Aja. And as the Amarlin seat, she probably knew every single one of them, and two of them were from her own Aja. And she, you know, she probably knew these people for decades, and then to find out that they are, you know, in league with the ultimate evil and against everything that they stand for, uh, it probably makes her question uh, trusting anybody. I mean, and she does. And it's that 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 vein of paranoia that runs through uh, basically everybody on the good guy's side throughout the entire series. I think that's one of the main points. And uh, yeah, I, I think the... I think the girls, I hate calling them the girls, but you know what I mean, have to be Black Adjah <laughs> Hunters. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't think I, I haven't convinced anyone to pull off that. Or Todd, have I? Do you think that they can, it can just be their own thing? And um, this is part of the impetus of, you know, what they're after about defending their friends and the access that they do get to Teleron Riyadh and, and these that type of things. Or do you think that this is something that Swan needs to lead because we have to have some kind of like manipulative side to Swan where she uses these pawns basically like, like Nathaniel said in chat yeah I think she does and I and I wish that it came later in the stories but it comes now so you know that's just it, it's where it's at so um I'm gonna go with Mary on this one okay doesn't seem like we can uh, change any minds here or that we've changed I think this is where we'll we'll end it uh this concept we'll we'll come back to this in the next one which we'll talk a little bit more be maybe deeper about the punishments themselves and this this aspect of being black Raja hunters but i think this is where we'll leave it for today adam thank you very much for being with us hope you enjoyed the experience uh it's just, it's, it's fun for me at least and hopefully for those of you that are watching to ask these questions right like in the end and we should all be thinking about this as fans of the books what does the tv show need to get the light to the last battle Right. And in a believable way from a characterization standpoint, a plot standpoint and an interest standpoint. Right. This needs to be this is going to be entertaining. Right. Like what's going to carry all of our new viewers through the story and what's going to really slow it down and actually distract from it. And, you know, what's going to stop Amazon from getting us to the last battle? And maybe that's the question I want to end with. You should be asking yourself this. Do you want Amazon to make it to the last battle? And if you want them to make it to the last battle, how do they take the viewers there? How do they get all the viewers and more in a growing audience that drives revenue in a way that they are willing to spend the money and time to get us there? And, and what does that have to do with each one of these plots we're talking about? And is this, you know, is this, <laughs> is this when you run, when you read it, is this necessary? Ask yourself that question. So uh thanks again for my friends mary and todd thank you for being here um for as always uh carrying on this tradition that we started just a year ago basically of doing live adaptations this has been a lot of fun and hopefully those of you that watch have enjoyed please like the video you can always find us afterwards on discord we do a little post show discussion uh if you can find links to that in the description and if you want to go follow twitter of time just Create a Twitter account and just start hashtagging Twitter time and asking questions all about the way of the time and discuss it with fans. It's a lot of fun. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. I appreciate everyone in chat leaving your comments. Uh, there were some funny hashtags. Uh, I'm trying to remember what my favorite was uh, from today. It might have been like, you know, no more map or something like that. It had something to do with the map. <laughs> map time. Map time. Uh, you know. But thanks, uh, Mary, for that one. And as we say around here, good afternoon from the Dusty Wheel and smash to black. If you want news and rumors that appeal, welcome to the Dusty Wheel.
If you want news or rumors that appeal, welcome to the dusty wheel.